I'm here at the Jockey Club Rooms in Newmarket, home to one of the finest collections of equine art anywhere in the world, and I've come to speak to the man whose labour of love it is to tend this much prized body of work. Welcome to This Racing Life. Ben Hanbury trained three classic winners in a career spanning 35 years. Ten years ago, he was approached by the Jockey Club to take on a brand new role of custodian of the art collection. I'll be reminiscing with Ben about his career both as an amateur rider and trainer, as well as finding out about one of the most important equine art collections anywhere in the world. And Alex Steedman travels to Lambourne to catch up with the now retired former jockey and assistant to both Barry and Charlie Hills, Kevin Mooney. In 2004, Ben Hanbury, who started his life in racing as a successful amateur rider, brought the curtain down on a training career that yielded over 900 victories, including three classics. Now Ben enjoys a third calling as the keeper of the art collection of the Jockey Club rooms here in Newmarket. I've come to speak to Ben and I began by asking him how he came by the role. I've been here 10 years now and bit by bit I've worked my way into the role of looking after the collection and I'm called now the keeper of the pictures because obviously I don't have any training and it also entails not only the pictures, the moving of the pictures, the cleaning of them, the restoration of the frames but a bit of this whole place is trying to become much more commercial now and uh, uh, so things get broken, the furniture, the silver, glass, so all my team of restorers, I've got a lot of local people who do an incredible job and they all, ben, they all say to me, Ben, what an amazing job you've done. I haven't really, it's the people that I'm lucky enough to, who I've employed, got working for the Jockey Club, who do all the work. I just put it on the wall. We've been given over the years everything you see, 250 pitchers, uh, the cups, the bronzes, everything and uh, most of them were collected in between the two walls but um, yeah we're very lucky I mean it's an amazing collection there is not another building in the world like this. Works by Stubbs? Well we've got Stubbs, Herring, uh, Fernley, you name it, Munnings, we've got everybody here, lesser known artists but of the 250, some of them aren't very good, but some are very good. But you must remember, we've been given, given everything. So I, t I put everything which was not displayed is displayed now. I think we should go and have a look, should we? We'll go and have a look and we'll have a look round, Dave. Very good. Lead on. So Ben, this is essentially where it all started. This is the coffee house, or the site of the coffee house, which is originally where the members met. That's correct. Uh, all those years ago, it was a coffee house, very small probably, and they went from the pub for the White Horse to here to meet, take bets, and those alcoves which you photographed. Uh, this whip here, the origin, the origin of it are unknown, but it goes right back to, to 1670. Uh, Charles II was rumoured to have used it in his races, and the first, we have a race called the Whip, which is held at Newmarket every year. It is only open to members of the Jockey Club, not the Jockey Club rooms, members of the Jockey Club, their horses. They're usually three or four runners, and the first race was in 1764. This is rumoured to be Eclipse's hair, uh, but like everything in this building, it's the history, it's the age. When you think, all those years ago, this was a whip, and wish we knew where it came from. Not a lot is known. We know that the Eric family owned it. We know that Lord Portland gave the money to the Jockey Club to buy the lease for 70 years, and 
bit by bit, the buildings have got bigger and bigger. And wonderful Hyperion, which was a Lord Derby stud, uh, and it was taken, Lord Derby very kindly lent it to us, and uh, it's a fantastic bronze. And it is a centrepiece of this whole building, and we are in the foes of doing it up. The stone's got lots of things, age has taken its toll. But that's my next big project, is to do that up. Now, Ben, this is the corridor that links the coffee room to the, the other important rooms in the Jockey Club rooms. That's correct, yes. And this is a very interesting picture because uh, it shows Fred Archer, and you notice him wearing a bowler hat and a long stirrup leather, riding a horse called St. Gation, St. Gation, where Sam Armstrong trained many classic winners, many good winners. And to the right, we have a sartorious picture of the first Derby winner, Diomed. Or, or is it Diomed? It's not Diomed. Uh, David Oldry, who's the expert who's written this fabulous book, discovered that the colour was wrong. All through the art ages, paintings were often not by the master himself, done by a school of. Yeah. And uh, now we walk on and we'll go and see the morning room. Okay. Ben, this is the morning room of the Jockey Club rooms. It's a particular treasure trove of equine art. Perhaps you can talk us through a few of the paintings here. Well, these are our best pictures by a long way, and this would grace any collection in the equine art in the world. There are some cracking pictures. And I'll start off with the Munnings here. That's a horse called Buchan. He wasn't a particularly good horse. He was beaten both in the Thousand Guineas and the Derby. He was favourite for the Ledger the next year and he was disqualified. But what's interesting is Alec Taylor, the very famous trainer, he left us this picture. But anyone that knows about money, that's as good as you can get. We've also got a sketch on uh, Buchan, which every artist obviously did sketches for whatever they were painting. And we also got that in our collection. Well, there's two herrings there. This is the Goodwood Cup. There is the start up there. And there is the finish. There again, there are two cracking pictures. Below is an amazing picture. Torpy is by Fernley. In Fred Archer, the Duke of Westminster's colours. And if you're buying a Fernley, that's as good as it gets. Now we go to Stubbs. Well, everyone knows about Stubbs. We have two Stubbs in our collection. We've got Jim Crack and Eclipse. Now, what's interesting about this picture is he had three owners, Jim Crack, but two of the owners wanted the same picture. And um, one was sold four years ago for 22 million, and it went to Qatar, we believe, to a hotel which was burnt down. That has not been uh, verified, but this is what we've heard. Now, if you're buying a Stubbs, that's as good as it can get. There is Eclipse, the other one. Now, uh, even though those look like the same buildings, they are, fact, in fact, four miles apart. There were many, many pictures painted of Eclipse. Uh, the man that owned Jim Crack sold Jim Crack to buy Eclipse. Could you believe it? Dennis O'Kelly. Dennis O'Kelly. Eclipse was never beaten. Uh, what is the saying? What did it say? Eclipse first, the rest nowhere. Is oh, that the rest one? nowhere. Also in this room, uh, we've got another herring. There's Matilda. Herring Senior is recognised as second to Stubbs. Stubbs was the greatest, and Herring is equally brilliant. And he did this picture of Matilda, who won the St Ledger. But what a, what a picture it is. It is a cracker. I keep saying that same word. But some of the pictures in this collection are amazing. We enter the dining room, Ben, which is host to a large number of paintings by the German-born artist Emil Adam. I think there are four Triple Crown winners 
in here, of which the, undoubtedly the most celebrated is Ormond, the Triple Crown winner of 1886, Fred Archer's last great horse. He was unbeaten in 16 races over three years. Uh, a Triple Crown winner, and here is John Porter, another fantastic trainer, and there's Fred Archer. And that is an amazing picture. Up to our right, we've got Spearmint, the Derby winner of 1906. Now, Archer is aboard Ormond. Danny Mayer, the American jockey, is aboard Spearmint. And in a 20-year period, riding was completely revolutionised. And that revolution was started by an American jockey called Todd Sloan. Well, he came from America, where obviously they rode a lot shorter. And if you ride a horse yourself, when you're riding shorter, when you ride short, you, your muscles, your thigh muscles and your calf muscles naturally grip the saddle much better. In, in Fred Archer's day, how they rode over six miles and that, they had a lot of very sore bottoms, I'm telling you. And now, you even go further ahead, the jockeys now ride with their toes in the iron. You know, from Todd Sloan to the present day, when you put your toe in the iron, you automatically grip. And um, that's an interesting picture. And amidst all the great paintings and bronzes and trophies, here, not only in the dining room, Ben, but in the jockey club rooms generally, here we have something completely different. In 1832, uh, William IV gave us this. This is Eclipse's foot, which is a snuff box. Um, it is silver gilt. This comes off like so, and the gentleman passed it round the dining room table because obviously snuff was um, a thing everyone took. But it's a, it's a, it's a one, wonderful, wonderful uh, bit of memorabilia. And there again, it's another example of the royal family supporting racing. We have several things that George the fifth gave us, we have cups, we've got lots of other things that the royal family gave. And if I might say, we've got persimmon up there. That was given to us by the king. How wonderful we are to have the royal family. We're now in front of an unmistakable figure, Her Majesty the Queen. Wonderful, wonderful picture by Paul Benny. Uh, the Jockey Club commissioned him to paint it for her 90th birthday. Ever since Charles II, the royal family has had horses. We are the envy of the world. We would have been a much poorer place without the royal family. She's a wonderful lady. She's ports racing, and it was so fitting that Estimate, who she's holding here, this is Estimate here. that won the Gold Cup. It's a fabulous picture taking at Sandringham. Uh, in the attire that the Queen obviously goes around looking at her horses, and uh, what more can I say? It's a fabulous picture. At the end of the last flat season, Kevin Mooney announced his retirement as assistant trainer to the Hills family after 28 years. Recently, Alex Steedman caught up with Kevin, previously a successful national hunt jockey, to discuss his life in racing. Well, Kevin, here we are, the famous old Saxon house. This is really where your career two cough must be some fantastic memories of this place yeah i'll say well in, like the first day i remember coming seven it was a 74 75 season it was in uh, august and i drove in here in a ford anglia <laughs> they'll beat up for uh, like. <laughs> ford anglia <laughs> and uh, you know come and um took my chance um yeah you know i mean but it was it was great to even get a job it was hard to get a job here in, in, with food. Because before then, you actually were apprenticed at Barry Hills, weren't you? Straight, straight from school, more or less. Yeah, I went straight from straight from school to to Barry's. Like a, to, when I left school, fifteen, straight to Barry's, nineteen seventy. Well, I've got a uh, horse in training book here in nineteen seventy-two, and Kevin's apprentice to me then. Um, his dad had seven stone nine. I think he came before that, I think he came in about 1970, uh, straight out of school. And I don't know how many years he was with me, but several years. Then he went uh, up to Duncan Sass, always uh, worked hard. His father was a um, very good horseman in travel horses all over the world. Your father had a, 
had a few rides him, himself. Where, where did the, the racing bug come from? Um, I think it, well, it, it was it was always in me for some reason. Yeah. And then, although Dad, he did ride three winners, Dad. Um, and it was that living that, in Lambourne, or was it just the first time you sat on a horse or a pony? Was, um, I always I always wanted to do it. Mm. I always wanted to do it. And we're going to go and take a look over there with the old uh, clipping shed stroke folks uh, garage and there's some um, tremendous photos and memorabilia in there, we're going to have a little look. Some fantastic old pictures here, uh, Kevin. Where are we, this actual building this, here? This is the, the the old garage really, but they used to clip all the horses in here. I mean, but Fook used to park his jag in here years ago. His pink jag. His pink jag. <laughs> and some of the, the real stars of, of your time as well, and some horses that were very much folded into your own personal history. What was it like to pull on those those light blue and white silks with the black cap? Well, I say, the first time I ever done it was at Windsor, mm. uh, a horse called Cranbourne Tower, who had been in training with Dick Hearn mm. for the Queen, and she le leased it to the Queen Mother for the, for the winter. And and he won, he won, he won it. He won the the first division of the novice hurdle, and then I also won the second division of the novice hurdles for Fook, and that so was my first double too, but my first winner for the Queen. Wow! You know I mean? so Nearly twenty winners. Yeah, uh, twenty. Yeah, nineteen. Nineteen winners. It's kind of a who's who of Lambourne here as, as well in this um, this old garage. Fred Winter is that? That's, um, that's, that's Mandarin. That's Mandarin. Fred Winter. And a guy called John Lawrence, John who Lawrence, racing yeah. fans might know as the late Lord, Lord, Lord Oxy, Oxy, of course. Taxidermist. Wow. Taxidermist. And that is, that's uh, Sir Gordon going down to the star on the flat on one of Fuchs. Uh, Gerald Oxley on special cargo. Um, um, dramatist, Bill Smith. Wow. Yeah, we the Dickler, Ron Barry. Wow, the Dickler. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. go and see actually where the Dickler, or oh, the great Dickler. We're gonna go and see where his box was. Let's go and do that now. Well, this is Millionaire's Row, isn't it? It's definitely uh, back Millionaire's in, Row. Back, in, back the day. in the day. And the good ones. I mean, if the walls could talk. <laughs> um, but the good yeah. ones were often in this box. In the, this box, the Dickler. Yeah. Dickler, and then Ten Plus was in here. Probably your favourite horse? Yeah, well, he had to be. He's my favourite horse, definitely. I mean, it was tragic what yeah. happened to him, but he was a good horse, and he, we hadn't seen the better, the best of him. He was so he was a good hurdler. One at the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, then and that sort of 89, 88, 89 season, he he really went through a sequence of chase successes leading yeah. up to the Cheltenham Gold he did. Cup. He was unbeaten going into the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And he was only what was he nine then? I mean, he could have come back. Yeah, for but he season. had no um, he had no mileage on no, the clock. He could no have come back for two or three gold cups. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. If he, I say, he definitely would have, he definitely would have won the next year. Mm. Anyway, I can tell you because I rode, I, I did, I rode in again. I rode against Desi that year, and um, um, again similar tactics where the grain was fast, um, and um, set the race up for a fifty to one outsider. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like riding for the Queen Mother, first of all? Well, it was, I mean, two, you know, for me, you know, a local lad born and bred, you know, to actually just get a ride for the Queen Mother was just, you know, it's, you couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And I'm probably a bit, probably young, really, to take it all in, you know mm. what I mean? But it was, I uh, know, it was fantastic days. And if you were to describe what sort of person, what sort of boss, the gaffer was for one. What, what was? Well, his 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 bark was worse than his bite. <laughs> uh, he was quite a. He was he was he was a very hard man, but a very fair man. And he gave him, he gave us all chances. All the lads that were here, he gave them all chances. And uh, and yeah, so he was he was a great man to work for. In 1983, Ben Hanbury travelled to the Keeneland Yearling Sales in Kentucky, where he paid out $43,000 for a daughter of the dual arc winner, Alleged. This ugly duckling turned out to be Midway Lady, the winner of two classics and the most significant horse in a decorated racing life that began as an amateur rider way back in the 60s. Well, I started off um, 
with Captain Ryan Price, the legendary trainer, as a, as a stable lad, basically. Then um, I moved to Ireland, where I worked for Dan Moore, the father of Arthur Moore. And uh, I rode about 80 winners, but I wasn't much good. But the best horse I rode was Lascargo, who I won two races on. He was a dual Gold Cup Grand National winner. Then I came to Newmarket and worked for Bernard Van Cutson. We had Park Top, High Top, Carabas. Uh, that was a wonderful grounding, I suppose. I spent three years there. And I set, on, set off on my own in 1971. And you won three classics as a trainer, but I, I think that the, the horse that we most associate with your career was Midway Lady, a 1,000 Guineas and Oaks heroine of 1986. How did you come about training her? Well, I went to Kentucky um, one day. I used to go to Kentucky three times a year. And I met this man from Venezuela. And he said to me, Ben, he says, I've had a dream. I said, what, really? Yeah, I found this horse that's going to be the champion of Europe. So he showed me this filly by a ledge, and she was very crooked. And I was desperate for horses, you know. So I said, I'll train it. And uh, it was an amazing story because she was incredibly weak when she came from America, but um, she just got stronger and stronger. It's just like a flower. She just bloomed and bloomed. And um, I ran her at Yarmouth. She was a box walker. They go round and round and round. I ran her at Yarmouth when I was in Kentucky the next year, just to make, make a mind think of something else, Dave. And uh, she was second to a filly called Untold, and then she was never beaten again. Untold, of course, Untold went on to be was a, a champion good herself. In her own right, yeah. And then Midway Lady won the Marcel Boussac, the Park Hill, and then she won the. Uh, the 1,000 guineas and the oaks. And with just over one to race down into the dip, Sonic Lady May soon. Midway Lady Alan Malik starts to make up ground. But it's Midway Lady May soon, Sonic Lady Alan Malik. Embro forget the rest inside the final furlong. And it's Midway Lady who's throwing down the determined challenge on the stab there. Midway Lady and May soon is going to be close up to the line. Midway Lady gets there. Midway Lady May soon, Sonic Lady then Alan Malik then came in. Inside the final furlong, and told next to the rails, now being joined by Midway Lady. Maysoon on the outside, and close home is Midway Lady who asserts. Midway Lady really stretching. Midway Lady wins the Oaks, and told his second, Maysoon third. And she was a champion two years running, and she was just... You, I'm always telling trainers, good horses just turn up in your yard. You know, you, of course you want every yearling you buy, you want to be a champion but they just turn up. And she was a, a freak, really. She broke her leg when she ran in the Oaks and she never ran again, which is tragic, really. But she threw another Oaks winner in Eswara. Unfortunately, I retired too early, but I had this unraised filly called Eswara and uh, Michael Jarvis did a hell of a job with her. She was very nervous, very like her mother. Uh, I don't think I'd have done a, such a good job as Michael. You also had Mattia, of course, another, yeah, another classic winner. Mat Mattia was, um, for a short space of time, she was very, very good. Angus Gold bought her for 20,000 guineas. She was second in the uh, 1,000 guineas at Newmarket to um, Bosham. And then she went to Ireland and she won the Irish 1,000 guineas by three legs. Uh, I ran her in, uh, in the French Oaks, which was a mile and a quarter. She never stayed, but she was never that good. Just for three or four weeks, she was incredible. But up towards the finish, it's Mattia and Willie Carson out clear as they go to the line. It's Mattia wins it from Dance Design, my branch, distant oasis, Priory Bell, Zafsar. We've heard from Kevin Mooney reflecting on his career as stable jockey to Falk Walwyn and retained rider to Her Majesty the Queen Mother. Now Alex Steedman recalls with Kevin some of his proudest achievements as assistant trainer to first Barry and then Charlie Hills. So Kevin, when you reunited with Barry Hills in, in 91, this time not as a jockey, as an assistant trainer, how did that feel? Well, I'll say I had the phone call from Barry just to see if I was thinking, I was thinking of retiring from the from from race riding anyway and um, 
and Barry asked me if I'd come and if I would be interested in coming just to oversee the horses coming into into Lambourne from from uh, Manton back to Southbank um, and I said I'd, I would do that job and uh, and then I also spoke and said that I would probably look and I'd take the job on for five years <laughs> a bit longer than five years <laughs> but, uh, well, but once you once once you got in with the with the great horses of the, around at that time and that you know what I mean so it kept you in and was it easy enough or difficult letting go of the the riding career from being um, a jockey well the the good thing about that was I could ride out I was still riding out you know what I mean so you'd still get in the buzz you know what I mean and and uh, I was all I was I was always riding work and things like that you know what I mean which was great so you were working with lots of different jockeys that used to come in and that you know what I mean which was great you know what I mean so yeah that just kept it well Put it this way, if I was to start training again tomorrow morning and I rang him up, he'd be the first one through the door. Um, I'm sure of that. But we've always got on very well. We've always had opinions about things, which you must have an opinion. If you haven't got an opinion, you've got nothing. So, you know, we, we, we always worked together. He knew what I wanted, knew what he uh, what I wanted of him. And, uh, he knew what he knew how to do the job properly. And um, when you think of all the good horses over that sort of 15, 16, 17 year period that, that you were assistant, who, who were the ones that sort of spring to mind? In the early days, obviously, like one thing, Royal Applause, then you had the great stayers of, you know, you had uh, further flight, you know what I mean? Um, and that, um, and then you know I mean, there was, there was just so many of them, you know what I mean? Did it, did it change your appreciation of horses in any way, going from being a jockey to, to having another facet to your career? Yeah, because you have to learn so many, you have to learn, when you're a jockey, you just, you ride and then you get off and you go home, where you just, you know, you think, so you're learning all the time about their legs and the health and well-being and, and, and obviously watching Barry train, you know what I mean? Which, which you learn a lot. And then, of course, you had the transition from Barry coming to the end of his career, young Charlie starting off as well. You kind of witnessed all of that. Barry had had the illness um, and that, you know what I mean? And Gennati was, Gennati was the, the horse, I suppose. Charlie was involved with me and Charlie was involved in, when, when his dad was in hospital. And, and she won, she won the, she won the Guineas first time out, and then she went on and win the coronation. You know what I mean? Which was that was a special day. I was there that day. I remember it well. It was um, it, it seemed an important one it for was the an, whole it, family. It was, an, it was, an, it was, you know, it was a, a, it was important. Yeah, it was important, and that, and you know, and Charlie played a big part in get, you know, getting her ready because her dad, his dad was, you know, in hospital for so long. You know what I mean? So we kept the ball rolling and and produced her on the day. You know, that was a really um, emotional day, really, I suppose, that Friday of um, Royal Ascot. You know, I thought it was a great team effort, you know, and um, Kevin rallied around. Um, and it wasn't just her that won, you know, I think we ended up being top trainer that week. Uh, so we had a great uh, satisfaction, really. But racing from that sort of 12, 13 year old who first sat on a, a pony with no real racing experience the, the, the bugs with you were you how will you still be involved in, in whatever um, well i say uh, at the minute we we're um we're moving in we're moving shortly as a family uh, my son's built a house for us all to live in so that's kept me busy you know what i mean so and i think once i've got once i've done that you net i mean it i I love the horses. I'm looking at them now, looking out the windows and that. You know what I mean? I think you want to be, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that, but um, yeah. So I, you know, I won't. I'll ne I will never walk away from it. I mean, I'll do something. Well, that's all we've got time for on this racing life. I'd like to thank everybody who helped us with the making of this week's show. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>